Folks, Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay? Amen. Not Glory. just on Sunday. Hallelujah. Huh? Not just on Sunday. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> For the last two messages, I've tried to explain and give a biblical explanation concerning Acts chapter 2. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit yes. and the true meaning of that. Amen. And I'm going to try to explain some more. Amen. It's a misunderstood passage of Scripture. And everyone here knows where I'm coming from. Being raised in the Pentecostal church, I believe in Acts chapter 2. Hallelujah. I believe in it. Hallelujah. I've seen the excesses, but I still believe in it. Amen. That does not vitiate my belief in the reality of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing's going to take away from the reality. <laughs> Even though I've seen everything from the ridiculous to the sublime. Yeah. It still does not take away from the reality of God's Spirit working among us. If it wasn't for the Spirit of God in every one of our hearts, we wouldn't be sitting here in this, in this church house today. And you might say, well, like one man said, oh boy, he said, I've been trying to get away from you type of people for the last 40 years. <laughs> But it's because of misunderstandings. Yes. And what we see or what we have, the American people has seen on the, on the um, television for the last, we'll say, 35 years or so. And it's been mixed in with a lot of stuff, with a lot of baggage. Amen. The baggage doesn't belong there. And, but it distracts from the reality. Yes. So, I must, it's imperative that I go into a few other areas to coordinate the true meaning of the Spirit of God in the earth. Amen. In John chapter... 20 and verse 22. This is a very, to me, it's a very important verse of Scripture. Start with verse 21, chapter 20. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, this is kind of a, a strange thing. He breathed on them. Did he actually blow out breath? He probably did. He breathed on them and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, same interchangeable terms, did not descend until 50 days later. But this was the promise. It was just as sure. That was the insurance, the assurance that that event would take place. And he breathed on his disciples and he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Old Testament. In Isaiah 28. Now, if I don't complete a thought or a verse, I haven't lost my way. I, I will come back to that. So, in Isaiah 28, verse number one, who is this promise or this denunciation addressed to? Woe 
to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. That's Israel. Yes. That was the chief tribe of the northern kingdom. He addresses this to them. And then he comes down to verse number nine. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And then he says this, which is quoted by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, in Old Testament Isaiah time concept, what he is telling the people of that day is that I'm going to send the Assyrians, and they're going to come over here and conquer you, and they're, going to, they're a people that speak with another tongue. Stammering lip, another tongue. That's the historical setting of this. And even though they come, because they speak a different language, they're going to come over here and they're going to conquer northern Israel, of which they did. But Paul picks up and gives it a different meaning. Now in verse 12, he says, To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. But even in spite of the, the uh, Assyrians coming over to Israel, to Ephraim, and conquering them and speaking a different language, a foreign tongue, you are still so dull of hearing, Israel, that you will not listen to me. You will not listen. The Lord categorized us as being stiff-necked. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Deaf of hearing, blind of eyes, and stupid of tongue. Amen. We are blind, deaf, dumb people, stubborn, stiff-necked, and even though the Spirit of God moves in this nation, we're going to say America, our people are still wicked. Amen. He sent us a rest. Yep. He sent us a blessing. They still will not listen. Amen. In going back to the book of John, John chapter 14. In verse number 15. Now Jesus is with his disciples. That we know. Fourteen, fifteen. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And this is the very end of Jesus' teaching ministry. I will pray the Father. And he will give you... A comforter. Is that what it says? Another. Another. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. He is saying, I'm your first comforter, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm your first comforter. Amen. I'm in the flesh. Amen. I'm your first comforter. And the word comforter, we all know, means paraclete, one who is comes alongside of to help. Yes. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Because I'm going away. Even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive. Now there's a sermon right there. But I don't want to get sidetracked. The spirit of God was not sent to everybody. No. Jesus said. 
the world is incapable of receiving it. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Spirit of God is in us as an individual. He is among us as we gather together. Because we share with one another, just like singing. That's sharing with one another. The Spirit of God is among us. But He can't be among us unless He is first in us. Also, in this same chapter, 14, verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. What are the all things that he's going to bring to our remembrance? The things that Jesus taught the disciples. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. I come again unto you. And I'm going to repeat that. I will come again unto you. In what form? Spirit. So we heard a scripture this morning that Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven churches. He says, I will come to you. Is Jesus here? Yes. Hello. Amen. Jesus is here. Well, I lost my place. Peace I leave, in, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, I give it. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again. If ye loved, if ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. I'm going to stop right there. Now in chapter 16 and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient that I go away. It's absolutely necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But I depart, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. I thought he said the Father would send him. Now he said, I will send him. Now who's going to send the Holy Spirit? The Father or Jesus? When they are one, they're one. Verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then he expounds on it a little, and he says, of sin... Because they believe not on me. Now, who's they? Because they believe not on me. I want to read one verse to expound this, to explain this in Luke 19, 44. And shall lay thee even with the ground, 
talking about the city of Jerusalem, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. He told them, you did not, he, he told the disciples, excuse me, he told the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, he says, you did not believe in me, and I'm going to destroy your temple. Now, that explains this verse that we just read in 16.9 of sin, because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit, I know people, this may sound strange, some people may not understand or may not believe, but one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit coming is to destroy Judaism. Amen. Long story made short. He came to destroy that temple, Herod's temple. He came to put an end to that mosaic sacrificial system. Why reestablish it? Now, in most Pentecostal churches, I don't think they would have the least foggiest idea of what I'm talking about. Verse number 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost after Jesus ascended back to the Father. And in Matthew 24, 30, he said, Ye shall see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's proof. That is proof that my sacrifice was sufficient. That's proof that I rose from the dead. And that's proof that I ascended back to the Father. And when that temple is destroyed, that's proof or a token that I have completed my work and I'm now on the right hand of God the Father. And he says, of judgment, this is 1611, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I'm going to go back quickly to chapter 14 and verse number 30, where I stopped before. He says, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world, I don't think was one person, but it was a system that came against him. But when he said, hath nothing in me, they have no claim or no hold on me. All of their accusations are false. But I, the Holy Spirit, is going to come and judge them because they misjudged me. When we, when I say things against that old Jewish system, it's not coming just from my own feelings. It's serious that they rejected the Savior. Amen. They did it. What I feel or think of the Jews means nothing. Amen. It's what they think of Christ. Amen. And they had about 20 different accusations against him. Everything from being illegitimate to being demon-possessed. That's what I base my feelings on. And they haven't changed their mind. But what does that have to do with the Holy Spirit? 
The Holy Spirit came to judge that system. Because Jesus said, they believed not on me. And he's going to judge this system today too. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, we read a verse of scripture that says this. Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What this actually means is be not drunk with wine, wherein you become inebriated, you're drunk, but be filled with the Spirit in excess, whereas you are drunk in the Spirit. Yes. Yes. He's drawing the contrast. Mm -hmm. Don't be drunk with wine, be drunk on the Spirit. Yes. So there's nothing wrong with being filled with the Spirit of God. Yes. In fact, there's a song in our hymnal, Fill Me Now. Yes. I think Bonnie sings that. Fill me now. Come Holy Spirit and fill me now. I went to a Baptist church many years ago just as a visitor. And the speaker was Dr. Ian Thomas. And he was from, he was an Englishman. And out of his whole sermon, I only remember one phrase. He said, the Bible says to be filled with the Spirit. He said, what is that? He said, being truly filled with the Spirit of God is letting God be God in you. Amen however he wants to operate in your life. That's total submission. Amen. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Yeah. So just letting God be God in us. What I have been thinking for many years concerning what we believe is what I call an apostolic four-square gospel. Being, believing, Acts chapter 2. They were filled with the Spirit of God, and they began to speak in other tongues or other languages. It's an actual language that they spoke in. So therefore, it's Jesus coming to them in spirit form. Jesus has come to us in spirit form. He's here. He's among us. He's in us. The second thing is of this apostolic four-square gospel is the Israel truth. Mm -hmm. Now, I went through this previously last week, but I want to read just a few scriptures concerning this. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, Peter is preaching and he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. He's speaking to a specific people. Amen. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Also in verse 39. Peter continues to preach, verse 38. 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent. That's number one. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Number two. Baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then he says, for the promise. Now he's looking at a whole bunch of Israelites out there. And he says, the promise is unto you. That's first generation. He says, putting it in plain language, Peter could say, I'm looking at a bunch of Israelites. The promise is unto you. And to the second generation, to your children. Is that what he said? And to all that are afar off, within the context, he's talking about the Israelites that were scattered throughout the Mediterranean world and crossed the Caucasus Mountains, northwestern Europe, and the British Isles. Those Israelites that are afar off, the promise is unto them also. And then the fourth category, unto as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. One purpose, one of the purposes of the coming of the Holy Spirit was to identify true Israel. Amen. I hope you get the impact of that. Yes. To identify the house of Israel. You might say, well... There's people, non-Israelites, around the world that are Christians. But if you will follow the chain of Christianity, historically the chain of Christianity, the Holy Spirit poured out in Jerusalem, and on these disciples or apostles, they went, they scattered and down and preach the gospel, and down through the ages, Christianity came west. And there were many different outpourings of the Spirit of God through even the dark ages. France. Well, Greece. And France. And Germany. And northern Italy, the Piedmont, uh, in different groups. Finally, the Protestant Reformation, that was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in restoration back to biblical Christianity. And where did it take place? In Saxony, Germany. And then there's been many revivals since then in the modern world or the modern age. The Wesleyan revival. Whitfield, George Whitfield. And then over in this country, the first great awakening, the second great awakening. The revival at Fulton Street, in New York. 1857. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Confederate Army, 1862 to 65. Revivals at Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Revivals out west. The healing revivals that started in the late 1890s. The Holy Spirit has identified the house of Israel by his work among us. But like Isaiah said, 
yet they will not hear. Just to mention somewhat of a contrast, being raised in the Pentecostal movement and believing the reality of the spirit baptism, speaking in tongues, and the gifts. The Pentecostal movement as a whole, my opinion, is off track. It's either gone in the ditch on the left side or the right side of the road. Because they have put the emphasis on the wrong thing. To them, basically, it's just get somebody to speak in tongues. Even if you've got to help them. Even if you've got to pat them on the head, shake their chin, or repeat after me, which is all phony. And it's really a work of human flesh. Amen. But the true meaning of Pentecost is to empower. You notice, well, let me back up a little. You know, there were seven annual feasts in ancient Israel. The first one was Passover. Fifty days later, there was Pentecost. Pentecost came to give, Jesus said, to give you power. For what? To proclaim the message of Passover. And also to give you power to proclaim that which is coming the next feast. The Feast of Atonement. And to proclaim that there's a tabernacle's coming. Not just to feel good and jump up and down and speak in tongues, but power to preach Passover. The power to proclaim there's a tabernacle coming. Jesus Christ is coming. So to get the full, quote, Pentecostal message, you must know who to preach to, who it was sent to, the house of Israel. And you must know that it's not just a personal thing, though it is personal. This apostolic four-square gospel, point number one, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Israel truth. Number three, is the 70 weeks of Daniel. What, which is part of historicism. It proved that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. It proved Daniel's 70th week is fulfilled its history. And its declaration, a declarative statement that Jesus fulfilled this 70th week events, and he definitely proved himself to be the Messiah of the Israel people. In other words, he's Israel's redeemer. Amen. And the fourth one is that Jesus is God. The oneness of the Godhead. Jesus Christ is not God number two. He is not the second person of the Godhead. That is blasphemy. It takes away from the majestic splendor of him, his person. Jesus is God, and Pentecost proved it. 
and when Paul was going down the road to Damascus, the light, the voice, and the Lord called to this man Saul, And Paul, or Saul at this point, said, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer came back. I am Jesus. Peter said, Let all the house of Israel know that God hath made this same Jesus, both Lord, Master, and Messiah. So there's more to Pentecost, there's more to the book of Acts than what we have ordinarily been told. And I feel that the Pentecostal people, a lot of them are saved. I'm not going to take anything away from their salvation. Of course not. But they have been cheated by not being properly taught the true meaning of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Pentecostal movement should be the most powerful movement, gospel movement on the planet. Amen. But many of them have made just donkeys out of themselves. Yes. They have. The abuse. That has taken place. There have been many, many preachers, prominent preachers, that were known as being Pentecostal. Some of them had healing ministries. And they also believed in the Israel message. This is not hearsay because... I've done my homework, and I've read their actual statements. And I'll read you a few of their names. And this is doesn't come anywhere near completion. There's so many people that have believed the Israel message that were Pentecostal and Presbyterian and Baptist and Church of Christ, etc. We couldn't list them all. But the problem is they didn't leave written documentation. But I'm convinced that they believed it. George and Stephen Jeffries, W.O. Hutchinson, Gordon McGee, the man who wrote the song, My Lord. Yes. Dan and William Jones, Albion Gaunt, those were Englishmen. Maxwell White, do you know who Maxwell White was? He was a Canadian preacher in Toronto. He was Benny Hinn's first pastor when Benny came to North America. And I've even heard Benny Hinn refer to Maxwell White. Fred Neeser, South Africa. Adam McEwen. William Cathcart, who has preached in this church. William Cathcart has preached in this church. He was a Scotsman. Wonderful testimony. George Houghton, the leader of the Latter Rain Revival. John G. Lake, whose books are now on the bookshelf in Mardell's. But they don't bring this out. John Lovell. Charles Benham, who was an Assemblies of God man. Frank Sanford. Charles Parham. F.F. F. Bosworth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maxie Clark. James Brook, he was an Englishman. Theodore Fitch. Frank Malden. Alexander Schiffner, a German man. 
Colonel Speed Wilson, whom we all knew, or some of us knew him. Thomas Lindsay, Gordon Lindsay's father. Thomas Lindsay used to attend John Lovell's church in Dallas, Texas, when he was on Keist Avenue, where he could hear the Israel message. Even Gordon Lindsay, if that name rings a bell to a lot of people. Amen. I have his writings that he wrote concerning the Israel truth. And these all these men were, quote, Pentecostal. And many, many more. In 1876, there was a man by the name of Dr. John Alexander Dowie, living in Sydney, Australia. And the flu was, it was an epidemic. And he said that 40 different people in his congregation died. And he came home one day from a funeral. And he sat down in his office chair, despondent. He said, Lord, I read in this Bible where you healed people. You went about doing good. What's wrong with us? And he said the Holy Spirit quoted a verse to him. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He said that verse just filled him, and he felt faith arise in his heart. And about that time, there was a knock on the door. And a little boy said, Doctor, uh, so-and-so down the street is dying. And they're calling for you to come pray for this girl. And he said he ran out of the house hatless. You know, back then, hats were a big thing. Yeah. He ran out of the house hatless. <laughs> and he said he went to the side, the bedside of this young girl, teenager. And the medical doctor was there, who was a Christian. And the medical doctor said to Dowie, isn't it amazing how the Lord chooses to bring his children home? And after hearing that verse, he turned to that medical doctor and he said, that's a lie. Amen. Yeah. Amen. This is God's will. This girl with a high fever, body racked in pain. He told the mother, go get a piece of bread and butter it, because this girl's going to eat. He prayed a simple prayer. He said, I even forgot my prayer. And he said, that girl woke up, said, Mama, I'm hungry. Said, well, her brother's over here in this room. He's dying too. He went over, laid his hand on the boy, instantly healed. I've read these testimonies in his magazine called The Leaves of Healing. Yeah. I've seen the original copies. Mm -hmm. And he came to America. He moved to America. Came to California, of course, first. And the news had already preceded him to this continent. And he said he was in a motel, a hotel room, and the news media knew he was there, and some lady, people started coming to him for prayer. He said one lady came in with some kind of crutches or some 
you know, help her walk. Her foot was rotten. He said the odor was atrocious. And he laid hands on this foot. Instantly, the foot became normal. She walked out of the room without her crutches. And he said, hey, take these with you. I don't need them. <laughs> now, John Alexander Dowie never spoke in tongues. I read it in his magazine. But the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. He came over here in 1890s. And long story about him. But verified miracles. Visible miracles. And in his church in Zion, Illinois, which was a big church that seated 8,000 people in 1900 with a real big back wall was hanging crutches and wheelchairs and so forth and so on. This is what Jesus said. And I know some people say, well, that's not in my Bible, but it's in mine. And I'm going to read it. <laughs> Acts 16, uh, Mark 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that have preaching credentials. No. No. These signs shall follow them that believe. Do you believe? Do I believe? Amen. You can lay hands on the sick. Pray for yourself. Hallelujah. Pray for your other people, yeah. family members. Yeah. Don't look at me like that. I'm serious. Amen. Pray. Amen. Pray for your dog. Amen. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Paul did that, right? Yep. Yeah. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt yeah. them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Yeah. But here's the key, is verse 20. And they went forth. And preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Not confirming foolishness, but confirming the word. So the purpose of the miracle was a sign to prove that Jesus Christ is alive and well. Amen. Not to make a show, Amen. not showmanship. Not to make a name, Amen. get your name and lights, or to collect a bunch of money, Amen. has nothing to do with it. Amen. My own personal opinion is that the Pentecostal mo movement needs a real big broom yes. to sweep out the trash. Amen. Prosperity, prosperity, oh, they say, well, I'm a man of God. I deserve this new jet. I deserve this house in Palm Springs and one in Palm Beach. No, you don't. Yeah, no. <laughs> They're abusing. Yeah. They're raping the people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Mm -hmm. 
Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles or carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give to you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And then he says, there are diversities of gifts, same Spirit. Differences of administration, same Lord. Diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It doesn't mean that every man gets all nine gifts. It means that the manifestation of the Spirit is made visible to every man. In other words, public ministry in the church. And then he said, for one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Not all wisdom, just a word of yes. wisdom. Appropriate for the particular time and circumstance. Mm -hmm. To another, the word of knowledge. My father told me that Many years ago, he was sitting in church, and some man raised his hand and says, I have a prayer request. I need prayer. My father told me the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, I know that man's request. He said he's going to take a test tomorrow for his license, like electrical or plumbing, or something like that. And he went to the man afterward and said, I know you're going to take this test. Don't worry about it. You're going to pass. The man never said what his request was. It was just a word of knowledge. Jesus told the woman at the well, you have five husbands. How did he know that? Just a word. Of knowledge. To another, faith. Now we've all heard of Smith Wigglesworth. Yes. <laughs> if you've never read the book, read the book, Apostle of Faith. This man, as in the book, you know, we know that he could not read or write. He was a plumber. And that was a hard job back there was in those days yeah. in England. Amen. His wife taught him how to read the Bible, the Bible only. Yes. He could read the Bible, <laughs> but that's the only book he could read. He would not allow any other book, secular book, in his house. Or the newspaper. If you went to visit him, leave your newspaper out in the bushes. Amen. I don't want it in my house. Amen. He lived in Bradford, England. He raised a woman from the dead. No doubt we've all heard the story how he raised this woman from the dead. Or he picked her up, prayed for her, and stood her up against the wall, and she yeah. fell over. He picked her up again. She fell over, picked her up again, and he yelled, Live! She lived. Amen. Now, oh, well, I don't, some people say, well, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. That stopped with the apostles. Well, if you find that in the book, I'll believe it. He died in about 1945. See, his wife, Mrs. Wigglesworth, she attended John Alexander Dowie's meeting in London and was baptized by Dowie and received his newspaper, Leaves of Healing. And in that newspaper was the Israel message throughout. 
So did Smith believe? No doubt. But we knew, my wife and I knew a old time preacher, V.R. Ledbetter. This is when we were living in Springfield many years ago. He ministered with Smith Wigglesworth when Wigglesworth came to this country and held a revival in the First Assembly of God Church or Central Assembly in Springfield, Missouri. And this is what Ledbetter told us. He was kind of a rough old man. He didn't sympathize with somebody crying or somebody not healed and get back in line. He would tell them, hey, I prayed for you. Get out of line. He was a rough old cob. VR Ledbetter told us that a woman, and he saw it, come up before him that had a huge cancer on her face. And Smith Wigglesworth did not pray for her. He picked it off. <laughs> said, here, put that in a jar or something. Next. <laughs> now, don't you think that he had the gift of faith? Yeah. Nothing stood in his way. Amen. Nothing. Amen. If you want to call this Pentecost, that's true Pentecost. Pentecost, the Spirit of God is not dead. He's still alive. We're also in 1 Corinthians 12. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, gift of faith, gift of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, tongues, Discerning of spirits. We've all heard of, and I have mentioned William Branham here. And thank God I'm old enough to have been in his meetings as a young man. He was a, he called himself a Baptist preacher. My father walked up before him in 1948 with heart disease. He shook his hand and said, God bless my brother. And my dad went back to the doctor and said, you do not have heart disease. Amen. Amen. Instantly healed. Amen. That's just one among 10,000 examples in that man's ministry. But it says, to one is giving, given the discerning of spirits. You could not hide anything from this man. He knew everything about you that the Lord wanted him to know. And in, I was there in the meeting as a young man. When a woman came up before him, and he said, this was in Palm Beach. He said, ma'am, you're not from Palm Beach. You're from south of here. Have you ever met me before? Have we ever talked? No. She had her arm in the sling. He said, I'm going to tell you how you broke your arm. No one whispered to him or none of this, you know, electronic bug in the ear, nothing like that. He said, I see you washing clothes in an old-fashioned washing machine, and you got your arm caught in the ringer. And he said, I'll tell you your name. Your name is Gavin. And he told her her address. <laughs> Miami Springs, Florida. Well, Sister Gavin went to our church we knew the lady. <laughs> and many years later, I met a couple by the name of Jesse and Audrey Marsh, and I was there in their house, 9 Lenape Drive, Miami Springs. 
And Sister Marsh told me, I heard Sister Gavin yell when she broke her arm. Now, Jesus Christ is alive and well. He still saves and he still heals. I don't believe in the fakery. I've seen the fakery. Now, I don't understand all this people just blowing on people and they fall down and get back up and blow on them again and they fall down and blow on them again and they fall. I don't understand that. Is this psychosomatics? Is it mind over matter? The Spirit of God can knock you down, all right. But he's not a showman. And whatever he does, it's to confirm the word concerning Jesus. Because Jesus said, when the comforters come, he will testify of me. Not make some big head out of some evangelist. If you believe this word, you take the authority to pray for yourself and for others. Do you have to speak in tongues? No. Do you have to be a, quote, Pentecostal? No. You're a believer. And I remember my pastor years ago, Boyd Bryan. He was raised up in the mountains of North Carolina, northwest of Boone. And they attended a little Baptist church, Prophet Grove Baptist Church, right down the road. And this was an old-fashioned family, you know, have you ever seen a house, big house with no paint on it? Never a stitch of paint on it. You can see that down south. And Brother Brian told me that his brother got deathly ill. Well, his father, an old man, barely read and write, no money. He never drove a car in his life. He said, come here, son. He laid hands on his son and quoted the Lord's Prayer. And the boy was healed. He believed. He believed. Now, I realize time is passing by. But I remember well in 1952 when my sister was miraculously, instantly healed in our living room in the house. I remember it. I was there. It changed our life. Going back to John Alexander Dowie came to America. He built this church in Zion, Illinois. Long story about him. He prayed for Abraham Lincoln's niece. She was instantly healed. Naturally, that made the newspaper. And during the World's Fair that was there, you know, uh, Bill Cody was there, William Cody, Buffalo Bill. And one of his relatives were di was dying, cancer. He, Dowie prayed for her. She was healed. That made the newspapers. Here comes the people. And letters came to him from all over the world, as far away as China. 
pray for me. And Dr. Dowie prayed every morning for all these letters, these people that sent in letters from out of state. And there was one man by the name of F.A. Graves, Fred Frederick Graves. And we sang his song this morning. He was nailed to the cross for me. F.A. Graves had epilepsy. He lived in Massachusetts, but he moved to Minneapolis as a, in his 20s. And Dr. Dowie held a meeting in Minneapolis, and he went to Dr. Dowie's hotel. And Dr. Dowie laid hands on him. He was instantly healed. No more epilepsy. Now something's going on. Yeah. The Spirit of God is alive and well. Yeah. Well, that was in 1890. And then there was a young lady by the name of Vina Peck who at 30 years of age, she had Bright's disease, convulsions, kidney problems, her head, excruciating pain in the head, curvature of the spine, enlarged heart. She was bedfast for two years, plus other problems. She said she was absolute miserable. They were a Methodist family. But she said some young man came to their town and they said, you know, he said, you know, I've been in Chicago and I went to some meeting, some fellow praying for the sick. His name is John Alexander Dowie. She wrote, Vina Peck wrote to Dowie. Dowie writes back to her and says, at a certain time in the morning, I'm going to pray. Vina Peck was in Geneva, New York. He said, just be in the spirit of prayer because when I pray, the spirit of God's going to touch you. And at that moment, she said she felt electricity going through her body. This is 1897. She felt electricity going through her body. She was bedfast, but she said, Mama, I want my bedroom slippers. I'm getting out of this bed. Oh, you can't do that, said, I'm getting out of this bed. She got up and walked, instantly healed. Well, Vina Peck and F.A. Graves later met and married. These things have happened, but oftentimes people never hear of them. Plus, there's been, I'm just going to put it in round figure, a, a million miracles yeah. in the last hundred years amen. Amen. of all types of healing. Yes, amen. All types. It's not to ingratiate a man because none of these men were perfect. No. But God gave them something. Look at the life of John G. Lake who was an associate of Dowie. F.A. Graves moved to Zion, Illinois and wrote songs at Dowie's church. And we sing them today. 
honey in the rock. Yeah. <laughs> he was nailed to the cross for me. Amen. And in his testimony, he said he met Fanny Crosby. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, by the way, the most favorite song to her that she wrote was Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Yeah. Of all the songs, that was her favorite. <laughs> There's a lot of history in the church that most people never hear of. And most Pentecostal people don't care. Don't care. They would rather have the hoot and the holler, jump up and down, and just make a bunch of noise and call it the power of God. No, that's not the power of God. You may get excited. There's nothing wrong with that. But Paul says there's gifts been given to the church. Faith, healings, discerning of spirits, etc. Folks, we as a church, this church and the church at large, is weak, yes. emaciated, Amen. we are powerless, we bow at the feet of a false god Amen. called the state. The Pentecostal people are doing it too when they claim to have the real thing. When money was offered to the people of faith, or whatever they called that, they had their hand out. Because it has become nothing but a system. But Jesus Christ still saves, and he still heals, and he still performs miracles, and he still fills people with his Holy Spirit. And I say these things because I realize many people, possibly listening on YouTube, figure what, you know, what is this all about? You know, well, if you know the real thing out of the book, then you can judge the real or the false. And you know, I think it was Spurgeon said, um, discerning right from wrong being able to tell the difference between right and wrong is obvious. But being able to tell the difference between right and what is almost right is wisdom. 